Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Data Science Hangout. So nice to see everybody. If you are joining for the very first time, what is this? Uh, so the Data Science Hangout is an open space for the whole data science community to connect and chat about leadership, questions you're facing, and getting to learn about what's going on in different companies and industries in the world of data science. So these sessions are recorded and they're shared to the RStudio YouTube, as well as the Data Science Hangout site, which is going to be brand new on the new Posit site pretty soon here. But you can go there to rewatch and find helpful resources too. Together, we're all dedicated to making this a welcoming environment for everybody. So we love when you all can participate and we can hear from everyone, no matter your level of experience or area of work. Um, so you can ask questions a few different ways. If you've been here before, you know the drill, but you can jump in by raising your hand on Zoom. You could put questions into the Zoom chat and feel free to just put a little star next to it if you prefer if I read it out loud instead. Otherwise, I love to just call on you to, to read it and, and add some context too. And then lastly, we also have a Slido link. So you can ask questions anonymously and Tyler or Hannah will share that in the chat in just a second here. You can ask questions these ways, but you can also jump in and add something to the specific topic if you have other perspective you want to share. It doesn't just have to be questions. We love to hear that too. Um, and then if there is something that you're really excited about and you want to keep the conversation going, I would love to have people connect in the LinkedIn group too, which I'll put in the chat again in just a second here. But I am so excited to be joined by my co-host for today, Marco Suerta, a data science manager at CarMax. And Marcos, I'd love to turn it over to you to have you introduce yourself and share a little bit about your role and, and background and maybe something fun you like to do outside of work too. Sure, sure. Um, uh, hi, everybody. It's, uh, it's fun to be the co-host this week. Uh, thanks, Rachel, for uh, having me on. Um, so yeah, um, I have a PhD in astrophysics uh, from Rice University. Um, completed that quite some time ago uh, at this point. Um, I actually spent about a decade uh, working in Washington, DC in science policy. Uh, I worked for a member of Congress. I worked uh, for my professional society as a, a science policy fellow. Uh, I was a McCall fellow. I worked at the Depar US Department of Energy Office of Science for about five years as a, you know, I had a lot of titles, special advisor, senior advisor, uh, uh, special assistant. Uh, but at the end, I was basically the chief of staff for the Office of Science. Um, but when that position uh, ended uh, in January of 2017, I uh, was kind of looking for other stuff, kind of uh, I ended up working in a part-time contract gig at University of Texas, Austin. Uh, but eventually I did the data incubator, uh, data science boot camp in fall of 18, back in the before times when we could do things in person. Um, and so um, I can talk a little bit more about how I got to the point where I could do that. Um, I, you know, had, I could use IDL in, in, from, for my science in graduate school. Has anyone ever heard of IDL? If you, use, if you use IDL in the chat, IDL fans, like put a post in the chat. But yeah, it was this proprietary C-like data language. That's what I wrote like my thesis in. So that was not a programming language that was going to be of any use to any data science like job I might want. Um, so I taught myself R and I taught myself Python. I actually found my first commit for a Python project, just doing like non-data science in Python in like 2015, it looks like when I was playing, started playing around Python. And then uh, my wife and father-in-law actually suggested data science as a career track. And I, um, uh, and I started, I did Swirl, right? To use, to, to teach myself some R. I got RStudio. I think I originally was using R and then I found RStudio, which was much nicer than R. So I started using RStudio. Uh, and um, I think, I guess I did the Hopkins Coursera courses, which are kind of like, kind of very similar to Swirl, right? They're kind of using some of the Swirl uh, uh, stuff. And that's how I, because Data Incubator has like a multi-stage application process where they give you like data sets and questions and you have to like type in the responses. And so I used R for all of that, right? That was kind of my thing. And then I think I discovered Shiny somewhere in there and started playing around with Shiny apps just for kind of fun side projects. And then eventually got into the incubator in fall of 18. And then uh, well, that was most, mostly a Python driven program, but I did use Shiny for the, my final project, at least for the web interface for my final project, my capstone as we called it. Um, CarMax hired me, I got hired by CarMax on the very last day of the incubator. So we were at the little going away party and CarMax got a call from my current boss at CarMax and making me the offer. And I've been there since I work in the appraisal lane. Um, CarMax uh, will buy cars from anyone 
Um, uh, we obviously use algorithms to help us make those decisions and those offers. Um, and then recently we've started about a year and a half, two years ago, we started doing this online and go to carmax.com and type in stuff about your car and give us your VIN and we'll give you a, a, an offer on your car. And that really has been my main focus for the last, uh, however long we've been working on that, um, several years, um, the algorithms, the systems behind it, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, so now I'm manager of data science. I've been there almost getting close to four years now, it'll be four years in January at CarMax. So happy to talk awesome. about the career transition stuff, happy to talk about the tools and the systems we use, happy to talk Yeah, about absolutely. Yeah. Okay, one one more quick thing. What do oh, you yeah. do for fun outside for sure. of work? <laughs> Something I do for fun. Uh, it's funny, I, I, I used to play a lot of softball and I was gonna play, we had the CarMax finally organized a game like last Friday, but I was in Texas, so I missed it. So I'm hoping that today we'll come back and we can play some softball in the spring. Um, I mean, everything everything's gonna be sore uh, after swinging a bat for the first time in years, but uh that is something I, I used to do a lot i used to do a lot in dc i had a, I had a team in dc that was a lot of fun um nice. hopefully, I gotta play that. hopefully i gotta play that again um these days i do a lot there's a lot less time i have a three-year-old so i just want to spend spend time with her of course and and the small windows where there's calm i play yeah video, play video <laughs> games or I actually just do, I do a lot of side projects ironically for with coding and stuff my some of my work colleagues are scratch their head that i program outside of work hours but i do that too that's great so thank you for the the background too and sharing your journey at for some people who maybe are, are thinking about making the switch into to data science what is like I don't know maybe some of your lessons learned and in, in moving over sure um so I mean I had a quantitative you know background you know I, I that certainly helped you know I think um I think both for you know I don't know how much it helped with my resume once you but you know, I'd done some quantitative stuff in graduate school I didn't analyze a lot of data you know, I could put a bunch of big numbers about how many, how many megabytes, gigabytes of data I reduced and stuff. So I, so I think that helped. But I think to me, the best thing about about the incubator bootcamp, this might be true of other other programs, is just that it reminded me that I could still learn stuff and relatively quickly. <clears throat> the incubator, the way it works, it's like every week, like one week is like web scraping, one week is scikit learn, one week is PySpark. You know, it's just like boom, boom, boom. And um, you know, at the end of every week, that was I a master of the new thing I'd learned? No, but. I'd kind of gotten a decent handle on it, right? And just the ability, just knowing that I could learn again, knowing that in my 40s, not not not, not a state secret, hold on, uh, that I could like, well, I guess I was only, it was like 30s back then. I could still learn all of this stuff, you know, and kind of, you know, figure it out was very, you know, it's kind of the anti-imposter syndrome. I went from like thinking, well, I don't know what data science is to like, hey, actually, I can kind of pick up anything in a week you know, full, if I work on it full time. Uh, that was very, uh, very liberating kind of thing to figure out. Um, uh, but it will sometimes feel overwhelming, like all career changes do. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So making that switch over and and jumping right into the role at CarMax, mm -hmm. how did you like find that transition into the management role? Yeah, so I mean, so I started as senior data scientist. I mean, my title was manager, but like it's really more managing projects than it is like, yeah. people management. Um, but uh, it you know the beginning, the first few weeks of CarMax as a senior data scientist were very intimidating right it was still in person right like we were I mean people were nice but I just didn't know anything right I didn't know what unit test was I didn't know we we're going to go these code reviews and people were making jokes about how, the, how they were working on unit tests and I'm like what is a unit test like I mean I, I knew so little about anything right so it was just very it felt very like oh my god what have I got myself into like what am I doing like why did I do this like you know I moved my whole family to Richmond you know my wife was about to, you know was pregnant uh so it was just a very scary like transition um but um you know, slowly but surely, I realized, okay, I kind of understand this. I'm kind of getting my head around that. I made my first little pull request where I changed one little thing and added like mean absolute error method so we could get that to pop out of something. And I was like, okay, I kind of, I'm kind of getting this. I kind of know what a unit test is now. And then slowly but surely, the imposter syndrome started to melt away. And I realized that I could add a little bit here or there. Um, uh, so the transition was tough though. I mean, like, you know, we're obviously when the pandemic hit, you know, I've been insulated, not insulated, but I had been in nonprofits and in government through all previous economic troubles. So like, you know, I, I was not particularly worried about my job, but like, you know, pandemic comes, stores are shut down. Oh, if we can't sell cars, we don't have any money. This is like, this could be a problem. And, you know, people started getting furloughed. And so that sort of, you know, obviously it's just, that was a very, not shocking, but it was just a very visceral sort of thing. Like when we had all the economic, you know, problems with the, the pandemic related shutdowns. Um, so that was very different. Um, but overall, like, you know, we, Carmex had hired some other PhDs, right, before me and after me. So, like, there was a, still a real, it kind of felt, in some ways, once I got into it and I got into a rhythm, 
the senior data scientist role felt like kind of being back in graduate school. You know, I was like looking at data all the time. I was making plots. The difference was instead of as an astrophysicist, kind of tunnel vision on my one little star that I'm looking at and no one else knows anything about, like I'm touching like a part of an algorithm that like the whole team is working on, right? And there's a lot more interaction, a lot more feedback, a lot more people that can directly help me, right? Because they know like they've worked on something similar before. Whereas I felt like as an academic astrophysicist, like I kind of was the expert on this little thing and, you know, yeah, I'd go to a group meeting and talk about it, but then everyone else went back to work on their own little things and there wasn't really a lot of cross, you know, connections. Whereas at CarMax, like, hey, we're all trying to buy cars profitably. And uh, there was a lot of good camaraderie, a lot of good, you know, especially back in the very beginning when we were all in person, you know, with people looking at my screen and like telling me and showing me the code, where the code lied. It was very collaborative and it was very, it was like a better version of uh, being, I guess it wasn't for some, you know, purely let's figure out how the universe works sort of thing. We we're trying to sell cars, but still it was very satisfying. In the end, it felt very satisfying, like trying to iterate and solve problems. When you say like building an algorithm or yeah, sometimes I'm like, oh, the algorithm, like I know exactly what that means, but <laughs> what, like what's an example of like a project that your sure. team works on? Sure. So the online appraisal algorithm is a good example. You know, um, you know, someone has to go to CarMax.com, they type in a bunch of information about their car, um, and we have to figure out what offer to make on that car. Um, can't get into the super details, but obviously there's some machine learning aspects of that, which I worked on and built out a lot of machine learning algorithms that could that could help generate, you know, that what the value of that car was worth. And that was a, a, a multi-month effort to kind of come up with new machine learning. Uh, but there was also like a lot of system stuff because we had to we had to suddenly respond to like these real time requests like the way the store systems work like you know i don't know if everyone's ever sold a car to carmax the old-fashioned way but you go in they look at your car you sit around for like a while right like you know the time the time around that the time of the computer doing something is tiny compared to like the time it takes you to go and sit in the seat and wait to get an appraisal right whereas if you're doing it online you you want to click submit and see what your car's worth really fast right so that was a whole new paradigm of like response time became a lot more important than it was and our systems had to be rejiggered. We ended up using Azure Service Bus. Ended up writing a ton of Azure Service Bus Python code. Who knew, who knew I was going to be doing that? You know, five years ago, um, uh, to get the systems kind of in line to be able to handle like this new paradigm of like, hey, we're going to have to respond to these requests fast and uh, and and send back a response fast. You know, to, with our partners, and we're obviously building the website and stuff. Um, so it was a lot of. Um, uh, there was some system work, there was some machine learning, there was, you know, we have to, certain things we want to look up about the car that we have to go do these relatively fast lookups and make that work. Um, so, so kind of pushing all that together, getting all this stuff in, into production, all these, all these things productionalized so that we could do this live in real time. Um, but that was, you know, a, a big, that was a multi-year process. I mean, making it sound like it's just something we did. Like it was like, obviously we rolled out, rolled it out in various stages, but, um, um, that was a, a good example of, of, what, of what I work on. There's other teams at CarMax. So I work on, this is the appraisal lane team. So we're thinking about how do we buy cars from like any people on this call. There's also a team that, that buys cars from auctions, like, you know, like Mannheim auctions and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's also um, a team that thinks about what we, what we price a car in the lot, right? Like when we put a car in the lot to sell, like what is that price? So there's multiple teams that are thinking about pricing. There's obviously a lot, a lot of other data science teams at CarMax, but I am focused on the, the team that thinks about car prices. Cool. Thank you for the context. Um, Frank, I see you asked a question a little bit earlier. Do you want to jump in? And hi. Hi, Frank. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to jump in. So like I mentioned, I'm still thinking about part of our conversation from last week where we started talking about communication tools. And Marcos, I'm curious when we think about communicating with your team, with your peers, with your stakeholders, Everyone uses Zoom, we're on Zoom right now. Right. Everyone uses email, there's also Slack, but um, I'm curious, are there anything else, any other tools that you use that you've tried to manage your time, measure, like manage how you talk to people, communicate with the folks that you work with? Absolutely, uh, that's a great question. Um, we actually ended up using Teams at, um, which, is, which is Microsoft's kind of Slack, Zoom thing, yeah. you know, it works and you know, I kind of like Slack more for some things like Zoom more for other things, but you know, Teams is, is what it is. But it, you know, we, I would say the beginning of the pandemic, you know, obviously at the beginning we were all in person. So a lot of in-person meetings, a lot of in-person conversations, uh, a lot of, in, you know, a lot of going to the third floor and having a finding meeting room at the beginning of like the online 
proposal project. Now it's mostly teams. Um, we did start using, and we let me borrow this from like our, our, our IT, our technology partners when we were working on the online, um, on the online product and the online appraisal product was, um, what was it called? Linkit. We started using Linkit um, as a, which is a tool to kind of track tasks and kind of have these lanes of tasks and you can make a card and assign people to it and kind of move it from, you know, the backlog to, uh, to working now to finish this planned or discarded or whatever. So um, Linkit is a tool that my team uses, uses a lot. We didn't when I started. Um, so it keeps kind of, it kind of helps us like, you know, you, one, it helps you, hey, I, I think we should you know, redo this table in a better way or whatever. We'll make a card for it and you'll, uh, or, and you can kind of help remind yourself to come back and look at it later. Um, that's kind okay. of communication. But we, we, we also started doing like, a, at least for my team, and this is something that I don't know if it was my idea or not, but I, we did something we did when I was at DOE. When I was at the Department of Energy, we would have a morning tag up like with the leadership would all get together every day, every morning at like 8.30, which was miserable, uh, 8.30 every day. And I would always be a few minutes late. And and we would talk, everyone would talk about what they had going on that day. And I remember bringing that idea to my boss. And I don't know if it was inspired by that or just partially related to that, but we started doing that at CarMax. And we have like, a, I think most teams have like a daily tag app where you kind of, and each one is kind of structured differently. One day we'll look at LinkIt, one day we'll, talk about, you know, we'll re review um, kind of open topics. One day we'll kind of look at this, this, um, this uh, other, other kind of structure we use. We're kind of talking about the week's, the week's agenda and stuff. Um, so kind of that daily touch up. And it, it's getting a little trickier as we start. I think everyone on my team is still like East Coast, but I think other teams are starting to get some West Coast folks and 9 a.m. stand up stuff work if you've got someone on the West Coast, right? So, um, so I think one team has moved their stand up to like, you know, later in the day. Uh, but that seems to, that seems to work. Um, but I think it's mainly that we, ironically, we don't send a lot of emails. Like we get a lot of automated emails, like telling us like reports and like graphs and like, you know, this model retrain and stuff, but we don't, we don't actually, I don't get a whole ton of emails. Like from my team, most of everything is done in teams for better or for worse, uh, different yeah. channels, channels for, for support when things are breaking channels for systems channels for like just my team and the R and D, um, that seems to be the main thing. It wasn't really my call, right? Like Teams was just kind of like, for sure. <laughs> but I think I think we figured out how to use it pretty effectively in the, you know, probably six months in the pandemic, we sort of had a good system going. Yeah, it sounds like it. And uh, it, it's really interesting. I, I just mentioned in a side chat here, um, we are all working on the modern data stack, right? Yeah. Like we are at kind of like the forefront of innovation. And I feel like a lot of teams just kind of go with the, the Slack, Zoom, email communication right. tools. Yeah. Right? So it's great to hear that right? you guys are trying some some other stuff that works for you. Cool. Yeah, we've link it. We saw we we borrowed it from. I mean, it's not really a communication tool. It's more of an organizational kind of project management tool. But we kind of borrowed it from technology because we saw they were using it. Our part, technology partners using it. We brought it into the appraisal lane. It sort of filtered out some other teams within pricing systems. And so that seems to be getting some traction. A lot of questions in here, so we can keep. We can yeah. keep yeah. yeah, definitely. I see um, Marlene, you had your hand raised a bit earlier, so I didn't know if it was on this topic too, if you want to jump in. Um, it's on a separate topic, but that's um, okay. Daniel go for it. In the chat before me. So I'd like Daniel to go first and then I can ask. I just okay. kind of stay rule you know, before. <laughs> so no, there's no rules, but yeah, <laughs> but I'll, I'll come back to you in just a second here. Hey, Daniel, do you want to jump in? Sure. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey, Marcos. I really enjoyed that conversation so far. I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about unit testing that you guys roll into your work. You know, I think it's one of those parts of pipelining that is very like human driven, you know, like what unit tests are you thinking about? Like, how are you including them to your workflows? You know, what's important for the kind of work that the organization is doing and just kind of interested to hear more about you know, what, what are some standard unit tests that you're working on, your team's working on, what are some non-standard unit tests, like where you roll with men, how much time you spend on them, that kind of thing? That's a great question. Um, so as I was arriving, the reason why my team, my, my, my bigger team, the core pricing system team was talking about unit tests so much when I got there is because they had kind of made a decision to make sure they had 100% coverage of all their entire, of our entire code base. And they weren't, because I think we had just migrated to the cloud. This is another thing that happened right before I got there. Like everything had been running on-prem and then we moved everything to running in Azure. And so I think as part of that transition, I think our unit test coverage had plummeted or maybe it was never high and it got lower. So there was a huge effort where everyone was kind of just grabbing different pieces of code and, and writing unit tests to cover 
all to cover all the lines for people that know what coverage is just in case you don't know like you can basically run a coverage report and like a test that you run like four tests and the test will like run this method and run that method and run this you know function or whatever and then the coverage report will tell you well you never this line has never been run right like you never run this line or this conditional has never been flipped because you never this thing was never you know the price was never less than ten thousand or whatever um so there was a huge effort to get full, full coverage which i was completely clueless about because i didn't want you to test what so i get in there and everyone's talking about unit tests all the time and describing how i got this thing to crash and i got this exception to be caught etc so basically our goal right now is to kind of basically have this giant it, one unique thing that i should point out is that what is i think unique to, to the team i'm on in in, in um at carmax unique to unique to this team and carmax and probably unique in general is that we are very vertically integrated like the team like the code base that i can touch is can have code that basically is wrapping around machine learning but it can also have it also has the code that is like running 24 7 in the cloud that is like hitting azure service bus right so we have like this the, the deployment of the algorithm we get really close to the deployment we don't own like the cluster like we have our technology partners that like own like you know the actual azure pods that are running the stuff but like the code that we run on that thing we own right which is very unusual i think a lot of data scientists kind of ride the machine learning thing and then kind of throw it over the wall to some production team and it's not like that with us so, so because of that because we have this production code which we call like our cluster code and we have like the code that wraps our machine learning models which we, which we call components like uh we have we kind of have all that code and we can basically run unit tests to try and cover every single thing right so they tend to be tend to be focused around like uh, at the you know uh, um we also have like wrappers for Mongo tables, like that we have like a wrapper that we've written around Mongo. So all these little pieces of code, basically the goal is to kind of just make sure that every line is covered. There's been some debate internally about what well, was the goal to test, like, you know, we don't have a lot of tests that like run through the entire pipeline. Like if we don't have like integration tested in the unit test and there's been a lot of debate, should we add things that are actually sending the ping pong ball all the way down from, you know, the raw request all the way to the going back? Or should we just kind of be testing everything in little bits? I think we're more testing everything in little bits, but, um, um, but that is our goal and so like we have like we have uh linting standards that we added so we make sure that, that everything is linted properly we have and we have it's all automated so we can run like we i think we finally put it into uh what do you call it i don't know how it works exactly because it's not, my, it's not my thing but basically whenever we submit a pull request like it automatically runs all the unit tests and it's good to, we write them mainly to make sure we didn't break something uh you know that's like the real goal right but we also write so that and but we also write them just to make sure that every line is covered and so i think it's more the more the goal um but the idea is like if there's an if there's a piece of code that runs an algorithm, then we run then we have unit tests that make sure that all works. If there's a piece of code that like takes in like a raw request where all we're getting is like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some some safe example to break out. But you might imagine that the, the data we get, the payload that we get, we might want to look up auxiliary stuff. Like I don't know, I'm trying to think of something that's 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 that seems obvious. Uh, uh, I have to be careful because our all of our feature engineering is secret. Uh, but just oh, let's just look at like the VIN can tell you a lot of information about the car, right? This is a good example, right? The VIN of a car like has embedded in it like the model year. So say we got um, a VIN and but then it, it was that means when you decode the VIN, it's like model year 2012. But then someone the, the customer typed in model year 2013. And they're like, this doesn't really happen. But we would we would have code that would look that up and check those two things against each other. And if the model year and the VIN disagree, we would just reject it and say this is not a valid request, right? So that's code. And we have to test all those things as well. So the goal is to just kind of test every single little method and class that we have. It's not super integrated, but it is I've probably been talking for too long about unit tests. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> oh, that's, I feel that's like you're very you. passionate about unit tests now, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> you went from not knowing them in the beginning. Yeah, now you used to have a lot of debates. Them. We used to have a lot of debates <laughs> internally. We used, to, we used to have more formal code reviews about everything. And so like the, what we should be testing was a constant topic of debate. We'd talk about it less. Marlene, you want to jump in now? Sure. Um, so as somebody who's used CarMax before, by the way, I'm always kind of um, the light bulb goes on when I realize that some of the things that I've used every day are actually machine learning or an algorithm in the background, right? You're like, oh my God, yeah, that's that's what mm -hmm. we do in play and in practice. So that's really cool to hear that verified, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, my question was about, so with data projects in general, right? I mean, you've launched some pretty big projects. I mean, as an organization, CarMax has, right? right? You've talked about a few of them. Um, what does the, and I'm interested from anybody on the call, by the way, if you want to throw your your organization's kind of MO in the chat, but do you feel that a, a project kind of gets delved down to you from the management team or does your team or somebody maybe from one of the other data science teams kind of start to bring projects forward 
they get looked at by management and then kind of get the go ahead back. Do you see what I'm right. saying? Right, is it kind of bottom up or top down? Yeah, so, exactly. I yeah. think that the goal. I think the goal to do like we want to we want to be able to appraise cars on the website was a. I don't know how high up it was, but that was a, a top down. That was something that came to us. Like we wanted, we want to figure out a way to do this, to do this, and we're so it was a task given to us. But I think there are smaller things where it is kind of bottom up. Like, hey, I discovered this cool, I discovered this cool thing. I, this is cool opportunity. You know, I sliced the data this way, and you know, this bucket of cars is doing this interesting thing. So let's change, let's change how we do this algorithm. Let's change how we do this. Whatever. I'm, I can't get too specific about it. But there's definitely things where. You know, people are doing discovery, come up with something, come come up with a new way to do something. Maybe it's faster, maybe it's uh, just more efficient, and then that gets pitched up, and it's like, yeah, this is better. Let's just do it, right? So it definitely happens both ways. I think I think the bottom up tends to be smaller components of a thing, uh, whereas like a huge like idea. Let's say let's though you could argue that the origin of CPS, which is like let's try and use algorithms to help price cars. That did start bottom up. Like I can't, I don't think I'm allowed to tell that story. But like, like the the person who came up with the hey, let's try and use algorithms to 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 help us with our car pricing. That did that was bottom up, and it was a effort to convince like the organization that like this is something that can help us. Uh, that was long. Well, that was before my time. Um, but um, so you could argue that that it happens both ways. But it answers my question though. Yeah, I, I think it is a healthy balance of both. Once you get it up and running, right? Right. Um, I'm in a position where. There is no projects, so I'm trying to figure out where do I start. Do I get management to start brainstorming, yeah. or do I start bringing the data science team along that I'm brand new, like shiny assembled, to start yeah. to propose projects to the management and start? Where do I start that? But I guess uh, it, it's a, it's anybody's guess, right? You just kind of yeah. throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. So I want to answer. That, I, want, I want to answer absolutely. I want to answer Libby's question, which I'm seeing before I forget, which is about sharing practices and we actually just started using a uh, stack enterprise whatever the stack overflow software but private whatever that's called i think it's called stack enterprise libby and that's been uh we had a wiki that was based on github you know our on-prem github and that never seemed to work very well so now we've kind of moved to this stack enterprise thing which we use both karma i think it's used both carmax wide and then we have one just for our cps team uh and and that's been uh, been, really, been really pushing to like Every time someone asks a question in Teams, like why don't you make a why don't you make a stack answer that on Stack? And so we've been trying to move that way so that people can can share. But it tends to be more technical things like oh how do I do this? You know how do I install this SQL client or whatever. I mean, but it, sometimes it is it is more like what do these codes mean or what how do we you know? So we're trying to do that. It's not really best practices yet, but it's it is it is aware it is a knowledge repository that we're trying to use. I love it. That's fantastic. I've kind of done that in other jobs where I've gotten in and I've realized people don't have a way to talk to each other and teach each other. Yeah. So I've set up like SharePoint messaging boards where yeah. if it's after hours and you're doing something, you can ask and somebody else can answer you. It doesn't have to be me, the coach, like <laughs> during office hours helping you. You can help each other. Right. I was kind of wondering, as an addition to that, if yeah. you had anything that was like knowledge sharing sharing sessions like maybe i don't work in the yeah. same area as you right. here's what i'm working on so you can get other people's brains we absolutely do and that's as soon as you started saying that i realized i forgot <laughs> another thing we do which is uh this thing called data bytes uh which is our little like it's kind of like a lunch and learn sort of thing you know um we it kind of it was going for a while and then we kind of i think we paused it over the summer but it's back and this is a chance so we had told, i mentioned we have these multiple teams within pricing systems and this is a chance for us to hear what other people have been working on, like you know, what tools did they use, what things did they discover. Um, so like, I think I presented a history, like it wasn't really technical. I think I wasn't super technical, but I presented a little history of, of the online appraisal product that we just talked about a while ago. Other teams will talk about their algorithms, the new versions of the algorithms they're working on, the new systems they're working on. And this is a way for us, because why I, I mentioned the collaboration is very deep, like inside the, inside the team. And every now and then you kind of touch like your, the other appraisal, the other pricing system teams. Like there is a sign of a, huh, well, I know they're working on this thing, but I don't know how it works. And so the goal of data bytes is to like yeah, get into the some details, of like, well, this is how we set it up. This is how we're correcting it. This is the, the type of kinds of machine learning models we're using. This is the data we trained it on. Why didn't you do, why didn't you try this? Why didn't you use this much data? You know, that the whole point is to kind of have a, an open discussion about this sort of thing. So it's really uh, cool. So the data bytes, yeah. my, my, my colleague Andrew has brought back the data bytes. I missed the last one because I was in Texas, it's like a team. Of the episode um but uh but it's a it's it's a, re a really good thing and i hope and we hope the plan is to keep, keep doing that kind of once a month i think and kind of we rotate through the four teams that we have cool i was just going to ask you how often so <laughs> once a month whenever i hear some of the like names people come up with i'm like geez why didn't i think about that that sounds really creative 
I see um, a lot of hands went up on one of your last questions huh. too. So you, you, do you want to jump in? I don't know if you wanted to add to one of the previous ones or if you have a new question. Hi, hi. Uh, hi. This is Will Carl. Yeah, by the way, if you remember, we had a discussion before. Um, by the way, Michael, uh, I'm VP of Data Science from Accenture Finance. So my company works out, works closely with your company, CarMax. I believe we have several, several programs collaborated together. Mm -hmm. And I just have one question for you. So you said that you build algorithms to use models for car pricing. Mm -hmm. However, when you use these models for car pricing, when you implement it, how do you mitigate the possible risk it brings to the business decision? Because we know that Carvana, they have similar models for car pricing and it didn't work well. I mispredict a lot. And they had to lay off thousands of employees earlier. And earlier Zillow, Zero, they have similar algorithms. They predict a possible price for house, houses and they buy a lot of houses and it didn't work and well either. Right. So, well, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so, there I mean, are I, some it, risks for business decisions. How yeah. do you mitigate these risks in real? Those are those are great questions. Um, gee, how can I answer this? Because the one thing I'm not supposed to talk about in the details are algorithms. Um, all I can say is you just look at like our success, like look at our quarterly like reports. Like you know, we're I think we reported in like our last like SEC filing that we bought three hundred thousand cars like online or something. Uh, you know, we make money per car. Like I don't. I don't want to say our algorithms are better, uh, but I think I think we you know we obviously monitor like how we're doing. You know we can monitor. You know we 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 know we know what we what we bought the car for. We know what it ultimately sells for. We can look. We can cut that by a bunch of different segments. And so you know we're there's definitely a a very regular process by which we're looking at the, our performance of 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 the company as a whole, our algorithms as a whole, uh, and and really monitoring things very carefully. Um, but if you just look mm -hmm. at our history, I mean I, you know the stock price, whatever it's going, Wall Street's going to do what it does. But if you just look at like how we've done in terms of like how much money we're making like per car uh and, you know we've been profitable not throughout this entire as far as i know i wish maybe i shouldn't and it's not stock advice you know what it was that this thing we have to make but you can just read our read our reports and we we seem to be man managing that risk very well obviously okay. it's been a crazy time you know cars are appreciated and they depreciate it i mean you've ever been yep. seen all the headlines you know about 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 car prices they've been it's been a crazy three years i mean i basically yeah. basically since we started this online appraisal product nothing has been normal about car prices and yet somehow you know somehow we've we've made it work um yeah thank you very much definitely yeah. thank you brian i see you had your hand raised too you can jump in oh yeah oh there you are <laughs> yeah so on the uh bottom up versus top down so i i worked under both um and it was interesting in one environment i worked in we we're bottom up and I come from a corporate finance background. So we did a couple of things. One, we weighted the projects on impact, um, ease of doing, and overall cost. So, so we would present to our leadership the people that were going to fund these deals, like project A, high impact or low impact, ease of doing, and how much it was going to cost. And if it was really big, um, like a system wide thing, and we would, do, I would do like a five year net present value of costs, and you do opportunity costs, and you do all the financials. Um, because at the end of the day, is if it's got to go to C CFO's desk, you want to speak CFO. Mm. Um, and but it was an easy way to get for like because our team would generate all the ideas, you know, people would be like, Hey, I want to do computer vision for this, or I want to do that, or I'll do something interesting with NLP. And so we would actually pitch them all with this sort of waiting structures. Hey, we can knock this out in about a month or this is six months and, um, and oh, but you may be able to streamline this or change these kinds of things. So it's, um, it's harder to just pitch ideas without that to leadership. I, I think that's the takeaway from it all. You really got to give value proposition across, I think those, those elements. Mm -hmm. I agree with all that. Thanks, Brian. I was trying to remember and I was writing this in the chat. I, I think it was Darren um who mentioned like this like rubric or that, that they use to decide like which product projects to work on too i was trying to find it on the side but again multitasking to, is difficult <laughs> i'm trying to keep up with the chat um i think alan yeah. asked a question about my time uh, program level versus people leader um i would say and i have made a point to try and and i think i mentioned this in a previous hangout in the chat that like i feel like finding time to focus on like, you know, to like head down, like actually like doing coding or 
out or discovery, whatever, I, I want to keep that time. So I, I started blocking out certain chunks of my calendar to make sure that nothing gets scheduled in those chunks uh, so that I can like, you know, head down, focus on, you know, doing some discovery or, or maybe plan with a new algorithm or looking at, you know, trends or whatever. So I, I try and do that. But, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously we have, we have to have meetings about, you know, with, with my, with my team about what we're trying to do, what is our goal. I mentioned that we have a daily tag up, you know, like I mentioned, um, we have, you know, what we call the ML ops. I'm on the ML ops team. So I, that kind of, there's, there's meetings. I do do interviews. I do first round interviews. So those get scheduled. Those get dropped onto my calendar. Um, I, but I think I probably, it's probably like 50%, like, you know, kind of all about service and stuff. And then maybe a little, it depends on the week, obviously. And then 50% where I can actually like focus on either writing code or trying to find a, you know, solve a bug or what have you. Um, so kind of more technical stuff. Um, and then we do, I do also help, like, I, I don't, well, I don't manage people directly. I do, I am usually involved when we hire new people. And so I do try and schedule time as, you know, for our new folk, like there's, there's formal training we do and formal review of like some notebooks that we have for training, but how to access our data and how our environment works. But then there's also kind of just check-ins with folks, you know, after the fact, like, you know, I'm obviously always frequently available just for people to ping me on teams, but I like to have like schedule, like check-ins, like as people are getting started with like, Hey, what do you want to talk about? But nice. I, but I I think I'm I think you know there should still have a decent chance. I don't know how level, how that will change as you know titles change and and work for, and, and and my role changes. But for now it, it's 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 a pretty good balance. It's also a balance between systems and algorithms. I mentioned how we own this whole stack. So even within that fifty percent, like probably half of that is algorithm development and looking at data and thinking about machine learning and thinking about you know algorithm design and fitting things and predicting things. And half and half of half of the time is you know systemy stuff like trying to like you know think about the code and think about the uh then the more systems aspects maybe not like we're trying to yeah something like that don't worry about the chat marcos i promise i will okay. i'll okay. collect gonna, the I'll, questions okay. don't, don't worry, worry. i'll ignore the chat Rachel's <laughs> okay <laughs> okay um i see timothy you had your hand raised too if you want to jump in hi okay. thank, thanks for hey. the talk it was really really great uh inspiration there. I'm going to rewind a little bit to the very beginning and sort of ask, um, as someone who sees themselves in a similar keeping options open in terms of career, um, what was the most effective asset that you uh, had that led to you being able to transition to your current position? Right. That's a great question. I mean, I think probably two things. One is like that, that that interest or or ability or willingness to kind of like teach just try and teach myself stuff like like I said I in graduate school I done a ton of data analysis and stuff but like it was all in this obsolete language that wasn't going to help me right so I had to teach myself Python and then I had to kind of teach myself R um, and then eventually teach myself more Python um, so I mean I think just the the openness to trying that and kind of I gave myself a project you know I, I, to 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 kind of figure out how to how to use Python and understand classes and object oriented programming which I did not understand. 10 years ago. Um, but then too, I do think that my work experience, because I had, you know, I had done a lot of non-technical stuff. I do think that probably helped. I, I don't really know how that was all balanced when I, you know, when I interviewed, but I did feel like I had this like record of like professional accomplishment that maybe it wasn't technical. Uh, but obviously I, you know, I had a, people knew I could write, people knew I could think, people knew I could read, you know, I had this, I had this track record. So I think, I think like, you know, success, even in my previous jobs, even if they weren't data science jobs, probably I would like to think also helped. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. And the second part of that is sort of a more like, I guess, personal passion motivation thing is how do you go from, presumably you don't get a PhD in astrophysics unless you actually like, yeah. you know, that <laughs> like stars or right, right. you know doing math about stars. <laughs> how do you, how did you translate, do the mental folding to translate that from, you know, you spent many years doing this to you know, a different position, you know? Right. And that's a great question. It's probably my dad would like to know the answer to that. He's like, I thought you wanted to be an astronomer. Like, what are you doing? Um, uh, you know, the, the first the first step was not to data science, of course, it was to the science policy world. And I think I had always had this interest in politics and in government. And, uh, and so that first transition came because someone, when I was at Rice, they have these talks like once a month about non-academic careers. And someone who had done science policy, worked at like the National Academies of Science and had worked uh, as a congressional science fellow, came and gave a talk about what she had done with her, you know, physics or astrophysics degree. I can't really, I think that's what she had. Um, and uh, that really fascinated me. This guy could kind of combine these two things. And as I went through my postdoc, like I just found my brain not really focused. I mean, I kind of enjoyed my research and I was kind of enjoying my 
wrapping up what I did my PhD on, but I wasn't super motivated by like the new stuff I was working on as a postdoc. So I was relatively, so even though I always love astronomy and, you know, very happy, and I met a ton of great people in grad school who are my, still my friends today, um, you know, it, became, it was a pretty easy choice to try and kind of pivot to this science policy world. And then from science policy, data science was more practical, right? Like, you know, and I needed a more, the, the, once you get to the upper echelons of the science policy world, it's just the number of jobs and openings become fewer and fewer. There's a ton of jobs kind of sort of at the entry level for science policy. But as you start to work your way up, I was I was running out of things to do. I was trying to become the chief of staff at a university. It's like two openings of that a year. So like, you know, it's just, it became more practical, right? And then it turns out when I did it, I was sort of, I started itching that part of my brain again. And I really enjoyed it. Like, you know, I enjoyed the incubator. incubator. I enjoyed trying to, you know, uh, do the swirl lessons in R. I enjoyed building. I built like some, some shiny apps and I was like very satisfying. And so I found that like, once I got back into doing technical stuff, I, I find it, I found that scratching that itch was still very satisfying. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate that. I, I, I'm kind of in the same position where I'm in academic, you know, clinical research, and it's like this pyramid where it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like the, you, the, you kind of get a little stuck. And um, yeah, it's really, it's really nice to be reminded that uh, you can always, life is, you know, long journey, and you can always switch courses. And it's, you don't always need to be looking at other people and being like, oh, they did, did this by age 22 or like, you know, <laughs> they've been doing, you know, right, right. it's like a straight trajectory to some to success. But I mean, yeah. you, I, mean, you could you. I mean, you could argue that Carmax is my first job because it didn't have an expiration date because all my previous jobs had some kind of like, it was, there were fellowships. So they were right, right. Yeah. So you could definitely argue this is my first real job, job that will go on forever and ever. <laughs> it, doesn't, if you wanted it, to. Doesn't yeah. have a, it doesn't have a built in expiration date like my previous positions did. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Timothy, too. I, I see there's a lot of interest in, in this discussion, too, so I don't want to leave this this topic here because I see Gregory, you asked a question, and and Alan plus one did as well. Gregory, do you want to jump in if there's any follow-up you want to ask there, too? Here, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Jack. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I see them. They're flipped on the chat. <laughs> yeah, so... Um... I mean, I'm also in a very similar position. I think Timothy asked a really, really good question about, you know, I'm in an academic world, I've, I've moved into government, and now I'm in this position where I had an economics degree, um, finished that PhD, and now I'm looking to try to potentially move on and utilize some of the ML skills that I developed through the PhD to be able to transfer into a, um, you know, more of a data science role. Mm -hmm. Wondering, I mean, you mentioned some of the things that you were trying to emphasize and the things that were interesting to employers. Were there, were there very specific skills that you were trying to sell to them or um, any, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, so you know, I was in this position where I felt like my best selling point was this, well, I mean, you know, I'm trying to think, think back. So I, I did go through the, the data incubator program, which uh, uh, kind of, for better or for worse, like when, when I was a fellow, this is like three years ago, I don't know how they've changed their business model exactly, but like I, I just basically didn't pay anything to do the data incubator, but I had to go try and get placed with their hiring partners was kind of the way that worked. And so, uh, and I was technically, I was, you know, I think it was only supposed to like, only supposed to interview with their hiring partners for a while. So, so I had this kind of like subset of like employers I could work, for, I could uh, work with and they helped me with my resume and stuff. But the, and the end result was, I felt like my, 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 what made me a little different than everybody else was the fact that I was, you know, had, I wasn't, a lot of the, my co colleagues there were fresh out of grad school, right? I had worked for 10 years. So I felt like that that background of how did I, how did I phrase it? Of working, you know, in a high pressure and professional environment, you know, in the tight deadlines, you know, that, that, that work experience was still relevant, even if it wasn't technical, right? So I tried to sell that. And I remember talking to the founder of TDI who came in for lunch with us and he told me to try and try and, and talk up that aspect of things. But uh, I also had sort of, you know, yes, I was new to being data science. I was new, you know, I, I recently learned are and recently got this boot camp, but I did had done a very technical PhD, right? So there's clearly, you know, data and numbers and statistics were not something that like were new to me, right? I mean, I had a bachelor's in astronomy, I had a PhD in astronomy, and I think that helped too. Um, you know, I can't, you know, I did a bunch of interviews like uh, uh, and when I came into TDI, I don't really remember how they all went, they were all different. You know, CarMax's was not super, um, it was more about critical thinking skills and like the, the kind of questions I got asked were not like, you know, co-challenges, whatever. They were like thinking through kind of, um, thinking through more of like a more like a consulting sort of thing like a case kind of interview uh, uh, and so uh but I was mainly trying to say hey I did a bunch of data analysis I was all the experience from my PhD I have all this work experience where I was working in like you know 
on tight lead lines, you know, working for you know, important people, you know, doing like it's interesting stuff, right? And now I kind of refreshed all my technical skills and like got to this data incubator and I'm ready to go, right? Uh, that's kind of how I package myself. Um, um, I know when we look at interview, when we look at resumes and look at candidates now, like, you know, we're looking for analytical degrees, analytical mindset. And, you know, it certainly helps if you're applying for data science role to have done something. It could be a bootcamp, it could be a side project, it could be, you know, some work experience, uh, some volunteer experience with something that, you know, you mentioned Python, Pandas, machine learning, scikit-learn, you know, um, even, you know, uh, things of that nature, right? Um, it's kind of the, the skills we're looking for um, to get, you know, to get into the into the door. And then obviously you just have to do well at, at the interviews. Right? Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great that you had that that program in place too, though. And that, I know you've mentioned like you're supposed to only inter interview with certain like hiring right. yeah. managers, but sounds like there were a lot of companies they worked with. Um, I know, Robert, you asked a question a bit earlier too. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I was asking sort of how you made the decision to use the enterprise service bus mm -hmm. and whether or not that's like your main way of sort of moving data between services. Um, you know, did you, yeah. could you have done more like, you know, PySpark and Airflow and you went with the ESB instead, or was there also like an option for like message queues, like kind of- Right, yeah, what, that's a good- How'd you center on that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't, I don't think, I think by the time I came on board and was like looped in and read into the, to what we were doing, the decision had already been made. We've been using Azure message queues or I think the storage based queues before. And I think, I think to do the real time kind of stuff with, uh, with, uh, with the online product, we wanted to move to, to service bus. So it'd be easier to link, you know, our response back to the incoming, um, to the incoming request um, uh, in a direct way. And so we partnered with technology. So technology kind of wrote like the, you know, the API, the REST API, and then they would send us the service bus message and then we would get it, process it, put a message back, send a message back and it would flow up. So you know, I, it's a great question. I don't know what other things were evaluated. You know, we were kind of already, we'd already kind of moved to Azure. I think there were other teams kind of using service bus for things. So I, I unfortunately, I I was not kind of involved in that decision. I was basically like, oh, we're using service bus. I need to figure out how, to, how the Python APIs work. I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of where I came in uh, and ended up re, re, not rewriting, but uh, well, rewriting a lot of our of our code to to handle service bus. Uh, um, but um, you know, it worked it worked pretty well for us. You know, um, and it, it was it, you know it was relatively straightforward for us to um, for us to to process those requests. You know, price those cards and send send the messages back. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. I just wanted to double check Tyler and Hannah if there was anything over on Slido because I realized we didn't ask any of the anonymous questions yet. None right now. Okay, cool. Well, I love that everybody's asking them here too. Um, what was I just going to ask you? I lost my train of thought. Oh, when you were talking about like using other, like using new tools that you saw that were helpful for mm -hmm. other teams. Mm -hmm how do you like start to like share those across the company? Cause I feel like that's separate from like a conversation about like data science or like right. <laughs> your process, but more of like, right. Yeah. Big yeah, picture. That, those are good questions. Um, you know, like, you know, I don't have too many examples. Like the LinkedIn example was like, we were trying to get like this, this uh, online appraisal service up and running. We were partnering with our, with our partners in technology who were going to kind of own the API. And so we were going to their meetings and looking at their LinkedIn board. And my boss and I were like, hey, it looks kind of neat. And so, you know, it turns out we had a license, Carmex had a license for it. We were able to get access to it and to start playing around with it. And it became, and then we, you know, we kind of try it and see how it works. And then pretty soon we ended up liking it and kept using it. Um, similarly with Stack Enterprise, I think it was deployed. We got like, you know, corporate email saying, hey, we're using, we have Stack Enterprise now. Uh, and then I think we realized we could make like a sub, because again, some of the stuff we do, it needs to be, it's a little more confidential than, than other teams do. So we were able to make like our own little, one of my colleagues uh, on the ML Ops team realized we could make a kind of sub, uh, you know, a team specific Stack Enterprise inside of the Carmax wide one. And then we created our own and then we could answer questions in there that we didn't want like the entire company to be able to see. So, um, uh, so that worked really well. So, so far it hasn't been, it, so far in those two examples, like it was relatively seamless. Like we kind of already had access to it. We could already kind of, we could already kind of use it. Um, uh, uh, other, you know, it may, there may be other, maybe other bottlenecks that I don't know about, but so, so far it's been pretty easy to do that. Well, yeah, I think 
just for myself, I think sometimes it's hard to know like what tools are available within a company. Like there may be a pocket of like, or a group over here that's using some tool that could really help me, but because we don't do the same thing, we don't talk about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we were, this was again, kind of 2019, 20, early 2020, pre-pandemic. So we were physically going to meetings with these technology teams and we kind of saw how they were managing their, their side of the project and that kind of, there's also something called uh, Miro. I think someone, one of the teams was using Miro, that's sort of Miro. Yeah. Uh, so that one didn't quite take off as much, but we saw it and we tried it and, you know, and we played around with it, uh, but it didn't really kind of la catch on with our team the way Lincoln did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's a question I love to ask the group too. If there is like a tool that you're using across your team that you really like or something you just didn't know about before, I love to get ideas. Like a random one that I really like is um, this tool called like ad event where oh, yeah. like I can like get people to like sign up for meetups and they don't have to like give me any details. They can just add it to their calendar, but it's something random. I just learned about from Robert on my team. So it's just, it's just cool to hear about what people are using. Um, I see, let's see, Luke, I see you had a comment in the chat. Do you want to jump in? Oh, you can't. Um, I just want to make sure that I didn't miss any questions here. Right when I told you, Marcos, so you don't have to worry about. <laughs> I'm still going in the, the chat. chat. There's there's fun comments in the chat. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm still in the chat. I saw someone tell me to stop looking at reading the chat, and that's why I was laughing earlier. I was tell me the chat. <laughs> Busted. I read the chat. I liked our conversation, like Alan, about like um, finding leadership positions that are not people leadership, and how there are a lot of people I've met in data science who are really interested in finding these upper levels. And you kind of sounded like you hit that in the policy space where you're like, right. there's nowhere else for me to go. I think data scientists hit that frequently. You found a sweet spot um, yeah. of like half project management, not really people management. Um, right. Do you see those in other organizations or do you feel like yours is pretty unique? Um, I think there, I think there are examples of people of of kind of you know mostly I see folks like me within pricing. But I can think of one person uh, who like you know I think is me, but more senior than me, uh, who doesn't who doesn't manage people, but like still has a very you know very a lot of autonomy and a lot of a lot of of, of, of product management. But I think we are. I think all teams are, uh, and I think a lot, I would assume this is happening at a lot of entities tr trying to think more about this and this exact question you're asking. So I know. There are conversations happening, I think, within within Carmex about like, hey, do we have the right titles, the right roles, the right the right career tracks for for people that that for, that, that makes sense, you know? Because uh, you know the um, you know the 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 strategy world that we're in is a lot more focused on, you know, like it, it doesn't quite map. I don't think those titles and those those career tracks quite map on to like the data science world. So I think we're thinking about that, um, but. Uh, but yeah, it's funny that my title's manager. I don't manage people, and so I get all these weird LinkedIn, you know, messages about but you think they, they think I can buy things. They think I can like hire people. I mean, I, I interview folks, but I don't like, I get a lot of messages that are mis completely misunderstand what my title means, which is really funny. I see that there was a, a conversation earlier in the chat about like, if you're maybe the only data scientist on a team and you're trying to like get other people on board or maybe they don't want to come on board, but you might be feeling like in this lonely, like middle spot. Like, do you have any advice for people? No, that's a great, I saw, I think I just saw that question. Yeah. And, you know, that, I am probably I don't. I mean, I think I'm really blessed to be on a team that is like full of data scientists and like, you know, you know, uh, and, and, and it really values data science. And so I'm not like the lone data scientist who has to like try to explain to people that we need to install scikit-learn or whatever, or we need to use open source tools. Like everyone, I, these battles might've been fought in the past before I got there, but like ultimately like, I mean, there are some analysts on, on core pricing systems, of course, but like there's a ton of data scientists. We're all we're all trying to do data science. We're all, you know, we're, they're super flexible in terms of what kind of tools we can, we use these virtualized machines in the cloud. So it's super easy to install new things. Like I don't have to get permission, like try I mean, I, I just, I learned about Streamlit ironically at the R Studio conference, but I never heard of, uh, I never heard of Streamlit before. And uh, and of course I also heard about Shining, uh, Shining for Python. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can, if I want to install this my jump box and try and, I'm sorry, death box and, and play around with those, like, uh, it's, it's, it was easy to do. And then I can say, Hey, let's get this installed on all the new ones as we, as we make them. And so, um, uh, so it's, I'm just very, it's, it's a very fortunate situation. I, I, I don't have, I, I've noticed that as a theme of some of these meetups, that there's like the lone person who wants to like, you know, switch to use R instead of, C, instead of, uh, uh, you know, Excel or whatever. And I think, you know, for better, or for worse, like 
it's not a problem I've encountered. I've been very lucky at CarMax. Great, thank you. Um, so we used to ask this quite a bit, and I don't know, it kind of fell off or we stopped asking, but I'm curious, are there certain resources or podcasts that you find really helpful in the space and like just staying up to date on things? That's a great question. You know, it's it's funny. I, I've started following more people on um, on Twitter. I don't really have a great, my Twitter presence is super chaotic. Like I have like a bunch of accounts and like I, my main account, I'm kind of anonymous on because I don't want people to know what I say, but like I, though I have a world, I have a world bot, right? I, I made a world bot like a while ago that just, it just tries to solve portals, right? And it has like 40 followers. Uh, and, but, but it's, but it's links to my GitHub. So like everyone knows that's me. So I started following like a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, like I follow you on that, from that account, hey, Rachel, and like other folks. And I started trying to follow more people who, who tweet about data science and stuff. And that actually has been kind of interesting. I think I found people from, from the from your conference, from the R studio conference. And, you know, I heard people talking about DuckDB and I started playing with DuckDB and how it works with Parquet files. I'm like, oh, this is kind of neat. So that has been like, lately it's been like, just kind of seeing people, what people retweet. I started following the, the Quarto pub like there's an account that tweet, retweets every tweet that mentions Quarto, and that's been an interesting rabbit hole to chase people down that way and see who's who's using Quarto and what they do. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a bunch of podcasts to listen to. I tend to like get an idea of something I want to do as like a side project, and then I just start trying to like learn how to do it, as opposed to like, oh, I should watch this. But, but these, you know, to, to be honest, this event and some of your other uh, meetups have been have been eye opening in that way. Um, and and of course the ironically, you know, the RCO conference itself, I is how I found this, this event and a lot of other things. But um, now I don't have a lot of podcasts, um, uh, not uh, that I uh, data science podcasts I listen to. Um, uh, but I am finding I am finding Twitter to starting to be useful. Find, following other people on Twitter has been has been an interesting exercise and in learning more about tools people use. Cool. Yeah, I was trying I was trying to remember in my head, like how we first got connected. And I think it was from the RCDO conference too. Right. But as you think about like some of these other tools or things you're finding out about, is there something you're like most excited about in the year ahead? Um, that's a, you always ask this question to people, and every time you ask it to other folks, I've been like, "What am I going to say when she asks?" Yeah. Me? <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, I don't have a great answer. I mean, I just I, I feel like, you know, I mean, you know, we are in a position at CarMax where like, you know, we are, and to me, like the most interesting things are these like visualization tools. Like, I think I'm kind of excited about shining for Python to see see where that goes you know i use dash a lot um uh, i'm always curious to see how that evolves uh i've just discovered streamlit so like trying to trying to start to take some of these emails and, and even quarto you know i've been playing around with quarto i love you know I, i've been trying to get that up and running and maybe i have a, have a fantasy in the future i can use that to kind of generate some some static web pages that we can share you know reports and things across the team so those kind of like you know, taking the, the data and the stuff that i would do in a notebook and kind of making it accessible to even non data science and not Python users, those tools that can do that are exciting, whether it's whether it's Shiny, whether it's Dash, whether it's Streamlit, whether it's Quarto, like things like that to me are really interesting because like we, like I said, my, my, a lot of my team is data scientists, but like if I want to share with someone a Dash app right now, they basically have to run it themselves. They have to clone it and run it themselves like on their own computer when I would love to just be able to like give someone a link and be like, hey, so we're working, we're trying to work towards that uh, in the future. Um, and Quarto is a great thing because we can, I think we'll be able to use, I'm hoping that at some point we'll use Quarto to like render some nice interactive reports with like nice interactive graphs and drop it onto a web server and then anyone can go look at it. So I'm kind of excited about that. Is the rest of the team kind of on board with using like Streamlit and Dash too, or there? There are, there's various levels of enthusiasm. People are always impressed yeah. when they see my apps. Like I think I haven't convinced people, I've only convinced one person to, to write, I've only convinced one or two people to write their own apps. Um, and the one person was really into it, I think uh, left recently. So, um, but as, uh, so we'll we'll see we'll see how it takes off. I think people always think it's cool when I do it, but uh, having convincing see other people to write their own has been a little a uh, little harder. Yeah, I'm always I'm always curious uh, about that. Like people love the output or or, or love like a shiny app or a streamlit app that you you create, but like what's what's the best way to get them to like take that and maybe make their own from it too, right, right. or is that just rely on somebody being curious enough to to take it and do that? Is one more question, just curious, is there something you thought that we would all ask you today or something you were like preparing for us to, to ask you that you want to share with us? Uh, I don't think so. I, uh, I was worried I wouldn't have enough to talk about. And so I wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't a problem. <laughs> Got a ton of questions. So that's, that was great. I'm glad everyone was engaged. I, um, uh, I, uh, I do love that you call like me a co-host, like, like it's not, I'm like, we're not your guests, we're your co-hosts and like, we're here to kind of 
pull everyone in and get interesting conversations started. So I really like that about the uh, about the hangouts. Thank you. I don't even know if I was intentional about that in the beginning, but now I'm definitely going to keep, make sure I keep doing that. Thank you so much for joining us, Marcos. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you this all. This is great. Um, uh, I'm going to drop, I can, I've done it before and I can do it again, but we do have openings on my team. Like, uh, oh yes. Um, Absolutely. And I can drop, uh, I think this, 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 this event's about to end, but I can drop some links on LinkedIn or just search any, any job that says pricing, uh, whether it's systems or pricing algorithms uh, that's posted anywhere. Those are, those are on my team or, tangential to my team so i can i'll drop some links in the linkedin group cool um, awesome yeah and if you well, i'll grab them from linkedin too but i'll share them with the recording here so if you're somebody watching this in the future the <laughs> links to those jobs will be in the recording details below too thanks everybody great. have a great rest thanks, of the day thanks everyone have a great day bye